The breeding of cannabis seeds is elegant and thoughtful and inspired, and we've talked about that here before, but actually doing the work to bring those seeds to market can be brutal. After you go through the work of carefully crafting and breeding your seed stock, you still have to sort and quality check thousands of seeds, design packaging and have it manufactured, assemble the final product, rock the social media to reach out and inspire fans, reach out to stores and online retailers to carry your seeds, travel all across the country to attend shows, pay extra for everything because you're a cannabis company, and deal with thieves and grifters and folks wanting to test your seeds. And this is all before you've been paid even a dime for any of your breeding talent. Any kind of startup is hard, I know. But a new cannabis seed startup is usually a one-person job until the company grows enough to hire help. It's grueling hours, lots of travel, and it requires an incredible amount of patience. If you want to learn about cannabis health, business, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you a new podcast episode as they come out, delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. Also, we're giving away very cool prizes to folks who are signed up to receive the newsletter. There's nothing else you need to do to win except receive the newsletter. This month, I'm really stoked that give, we're giving away several newly released Air Vape X vaporizers from airvapeusa.com. Go to shapingfire.com to sign up for the newsletter before June 30th and be entered into this month's and all future newsletter prize drawings. Also, remember that we have a thriving YouTube channel too with original content separate from what you hear on the podcast. Right now, we're featuring a series of interview questions with Kevin Jodry of Wonderland Nursery. We have nearly a hundred videos that you will see nowhere else. So check it out at youtube.com forward slash shangolos or just search Shaping Fire on YouTube. You are listening to Shaping Fire and I'm your host, Shango Los. My guest today is Eric Wimber. Eric is founder, breeder, and head of operations of Dungeons Vault Genetics. His boutique cannabis seeds company is sweeping the industry with a unique line of pungent and potent cannabis strains. His strains have won over 10 cannabis cups in just the last two years, including first place just recently in the 2018 Aloha Cup in Hawaii. Today, we're going to talk about the seed game. Welcome to the show, Eric. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, you know, let's let's go ahead and start right at the beginning, right? Because part of what we want to talk about today is is the, the arc that somebody who wants to start a seed company would take from deciding that they want to, you know, climb this hill versus you know when they're starting to win cups. So, so where did you learn your skills? Did you have a have a mentor or an internship? How did you get into the scene? You know, basically from the time I was a young kid on, I think I just had a really a very peaked interest in cannabis. I was, you know, I was turned on to it by a neighbor who, um, he showed me some killer herb and he was very into high times magazine back in the day. So he kind of showed me that kind of got me going. And I really started focusing a lot of my attention onto the different strains and, and all these different varieties of, uh, you know, cannabis around the world. Um, I think it wasn't till I hooked up with a guy that introduced me to Ken Estes from granddaddy that I, that I really took a, a stance toward the breeding aspect. I had thought about it before, but it was never really something that I had considered. I always thought it was going to be a lot harder, and I left that up for the pros to do. So um, it was kind of out of sight, out of mind. But working with Granddaddy, it kind of it kind of opened up the doors. It, it showed me, you know, what what people were after. I I knew I wanted to create things that I wanted to smoke, and I figure if I'm um, putting things out that I like to smoke, other people would uh, enjoy it as well. So that's sort of how it went. Um, he, he had some falling out with some employees, and so I was uh, upgraded from uh, seed rep and online uh, you know, sales guy to um, full-blown breeder for Ken. And so that, that, that sort of put a fire under my ass and, and really um, – brought the light on the whole situation. You know, I think that's a good thing to point out too, that you started at the bottom, right? You started oh, yeah. doing sales for somebody else. There's a lot of people who, who want to get into, well, every part of this industry and they want to start at the top, right? And it's like, no man, you know, a lot of people, you, you start at the bottom and you learn your skills. That way, when you go ahead to start your own business, you've already done all the jobs from, you know, sweep, sweeping the floors all the way up and it, it gives you better skills to, to run the company. 
So, so when you were, you know, air quotes breeding at um, at Granddaddy, what did that actually involve? Were were you doing big sifts, or was this more like manufacturing lines that were pre existing? Uh, I came on board with literally absolutely nothing. We had <clears throat> we had all of our uh, original clone stock was stripped from us. Um, the guys who were working with him out in Oakland and NorCal, um, they all literally left one day. They just every they, everyone grabbed their shit and left and just left wow. him high and dry. So it was it was it was a weird situation, and he knew that he was. Uh, you know, we had a very popular brand. We were doing really well at Attitude Seed Bank. Um, he needed some help, so I basically started over with everything. I had we had we had uh, our GDP line, which we were most known for. So I used a, a GDP male and another male, which was a Tahoe G times Granddaddy Perp, and that that was our pretty much our 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 bread and butter, and that started the whole new uh, line. We did I did I think eleven or twelve new strains for him. Um, recreated the Candyland, which was lost. They 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 lost that one completely. So I redid it, and again made it. You know, sold out. Right on. You know, it's kind of funny. A lot of people say, "Oh, you know, somebody or other they got they got a break, right?" And it's like, yeah, this you definitely got a break, but you had already been there for a long time, uh, slanging somebody else's seeds, and you just happen to be there for the break, right? And that's that, you know, people say, "Oh, that's luck." Well, you know, that's putting in your time. Oh yeah, no, I started at the bottom. I was there was there were there was uh, years, two, three plus years of me literally not getting paid anything but seeds and then getting to you know i got to keep some part of my sales but that sales are made by me driving around all over the state and you know hitting the hitting the uh, stores hard you know back when medical days was going on so i was hitting up every single store from olympia to seattle and above there trying to sell them seeds so it was one of those things like i had to put a lot of time and effort in before i was even granted the 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 opportunity to to breed for him and even then that came with a lot of uh you know, there was a lot of things attached to it, you know, and a lot of drama and a lot of things that you might not expect. So I kind of had a, um, not, not a shoe in, that's definitely not the word to say, but I kind of had, we, since we already had a good thing going, I, it couldn't have been, it couldn't have worked out better is what I'm getting at because we, we had already had, the ball was already rolling. Whereas if someone who was just getting started, it's going to be a hell of a lot harder to, to just pop up in the scene and be like, hi, I'm a new breeder. Take my stuff. You know, it's, you need, it takes a little bit to get accepted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny how much um, staying in cannabis is not getting sucked into drama, especially, you know, in the seed scene, right? There's so much drama in seeds that, that a lot of the work is actually not getting yourself sucked into that politics. Very much so. I mean, it's uh, I I might have a little bit of a, a problem to keep in my mouth shit at times because <laughs> I, it's hard. You, you have so, so many people that want to give their opinion and say something completely negative or off topic and just basically just talk shit. So it's, 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 it's one of those things you can be the bigger person say, you know what, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to respond, give them the pleasure of it, you know, or you can just be like, you know what, T I'm going to go a different route. I'm just going to be the guy that sticks up for himself and, and I'll just say what's on my mind. Cause I don't really, I mean, I care what people think of me obviously, but I want them to know that I'm not going to just be a pushover. If you have something to say, I'll say something right back. I treat people with, you know, as much respect as you'll give me and we can all be friends. But, um, it's, it's very, very drama filled industry. I tell you what, it's like, it's like high school all over again. There's clicks, there's people that they shake in your hand, you're talking, like, everything's all good. As soon as you walk away, it's fuck that guy. Yeah. <laughs> so it really, it really, it really just depends. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a good thing. It's probably best to just stay out of the drum and just kind of focus on your brand. I, sh I should probably take my own advice a little bit more. But yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's really it's cutthroat industry, man. It really is. Yeah. So so at some point you're working over at Granddaddy and you had this idea, like you know what, I want to grow the kind of stuff. I want to breed the kind of stuff that I want to smoke. Did that would did that happen early on when you were still selling, or did that did that idea occur to you once you had already started uh, breeding at Ken's? I th I think a little bit of both, really, because he, knowing what we want to achieve and and my own knowledge, he he only gave me the opportunity I I was given based on him seeing how I I, I treated the weed, how how I talked about it. He he could see I was passionate. I had a lot of knowledge in the in the um, in the strain. Um, 
history of strains, excuse me. Um, so he was very into my opinion and what I could come up with. And so I think he was, as soon as I started talking to him and showing him, he just trusted me from the jump and knew that there was going to be some good things that came from it. And sure enough, um, they did. So we had some good things come, a lot of a lot of uh, really popular strains. Some of the lines, like I said before, were, were totally sold out on Attitude and, and continued to be as long as we could produce the seeds, they were gone. So it was it was good. Was there some time that there was an overlap between when you started Dungeons Vault and were still over at Granddaddy? Or did you did, was there a clean break between the two? Oh, it was 100% clean break. I mean, I don't want to get into too much of the 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 nitty gritty of what happened, but at the same time, it's 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 all over the internet. I've 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 been very vocal about what happened. Um, I was working with Ken. We had a big falling out, and as and as just like any other job, I called him up and said, "Hey, you know what? This is me putting my resignation in. I wish you the best, but I'm out." And that was that was when I immediately broke ties with them. It was December of 2014 when that happened. And literally, the idea was already sparked in my head of Dungeons Vault Genetics. I, I jokingly tossed the name around, you know, uh, back in like 2009 to uh, actually it was Red Eye and Ready, uh, Red Eye Genetics. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he, I, had, I had joked him about it. And so it was as soon as I broke away from Ken, the idea was just it was already there. And I, I jumped with it immediately. All right, so so let's let's take us back to that day. So so you you decided that you are on your own feet now, and Dungeons Vault is is going to be real as of today because you had just given your notice. What were the things that you determined were the first things that you needed to get done? Because because obviously you need you needed to not only get the brand up and running, but you also needed to get something out to be able to make some money at the same time. So what were your task priorities at that point? Well, it's a, that's a very good question because that that's kind of where the where I had a little bit of trouble at early on stages. Me starting a company, and this is exactly what I was telling you about earlier. Is you, you, anybody can make seeds, but you come to the market with them, and all of a sudden, it's who are you, and how did you get this, and who, who you know where did you get your stuff, and how did you breed these? There's a ton of questions that come with it. But what really happened was, um, I I literally knew immediately that you know i mean i have i had leftover stock that wasn't you know taken from me when i i gave ken a ton of stuff to go sell and that was part of the reason we had a big breakup because i never ended up getting paid for uh you know a very large quantity of seeds that were go going out to to europe so i never got my pay on that so that was kind of what started the whole you know split up but uh i still had stock left over from granddaddy days so basically i rebranded and then that was part of the reason people were having trouble with me because they're like well you broke away from granddaddy but you still have the same strains as granddaddy and you stole them which in all reality i never stole a thing i i worked strains for him i did the work i did everything under my roof with my money my lights everything so nothing was stolen but it was just odd for people to see me coming out with the same exact ones that I'd already released under Granity. So the biggest priority for me at that time was get new strains that separate yourself from him, from, you know, the whole, the split needs to happen and be completely clean, you know, and have your own line that can, that you're coming out with, with your own ideas, your own strains you did and with no one else's input. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah, I can see how that would be, you know, both confusing because because you're feeling legit. You weren't feeling guilty at all or that you had done something wrong. But 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 the the buying public's all like, "Hey man, this is kind of weird, right?" So so as fast as you could put those strains behind you and have your own thing going, the better. So so in those early days, right? Um, well, actually, let's let's start with the ultra basic question. Where did the name come for Dungeons Vault Genetics? Because it's you know it's a pretty unique thing. You know, it's not like you know some kind of generic cannabis name like there's so many of them. Where did it come from? No, yeah, no, it, I don't know, man. I I swear, there's just, for me, uh, cannabis has been you know, as some people could say, hallucinogens open the doors for certain things for their art or whatever. Well, cannabis has made me a very creative person. I think. Um, Really, when it comes down to names and even my strain names or how I came up with Dungeons of All, it's all it's all comes together with me just sitting around and smoking a joint or just thinking to myself about how what what sounds good or what sounds cool. Let me say this right now: I am not a Dungeons and Dragons fan. I don't <laughs> mind if you if you play Dungeons and Dragons, whether you were a child and played it and loved it, or you're into it as an adult, that's fine. But I just that was not my thing. I never really rolled those dice, but. Um, Dungeons and Dungeons Vault Genetics was something that came up. Like I said, back in I think it was '09, I was online and I was I was making a joke about all these guys that were talking about starting up a seed company. And I was like, oh, it's that easy, and you guys are all just going to start. Oh, I might as well do it too. 
And I said, I'm going to start Dungeons Vault Genetics. And it was literally a joke. Like, I was joking when I said it, but I really had thought about the name. I thought it was a cool name, but I was already working with uh, Ken at Granddaddy, and I, I had no no uh, desire to leave at the time. You know, everything was fine. We were doing great. We were killing it. So I, I had no uh, no plan on leaving, but over time, it just started making more and more sense. But that's literally, it's just... I can't say a ton of thought went into it, just just enough to where I thought the name was cool, and I just wanted to really think about, you know, man, I guess really if you think about it, the dun- a dungeon is a cool, dark place where they keep, you know, prisoners. So nothing about cannabis has to do with, you know, we don't want to think about being locked up, and that's not really what I was going with. But the dungeon is a place that's, you know, it's it's locked up, it's kept, it's it's under control, you know. So the vault, even even more so, it's a locked up vault. It's in the dungeon. It's kept away. It's a sec- it's a secret place, whatever. So those strains, those genetics are kept up in lock up, and now they're being released to the community. So that's kind of where I was going with it. Yeah, right on. That makes a lot of sense. And it's funny that it, it just started as a, an online, you know, stoner joke. But then yeah. when the day came that you needed a name, you're like, well, shit, I guess I already have a name. Let's just go with it. Exactly. I mean, it really, it was as simple as that. I said, wow, well, this couldn't have worked. It's funny. That's how life works sometimes. Some, you, you think about something or you put an idea down on paper and, and you you might look at it a couple times here and there, but you don't really think that it's going to actually be something that happens. And then all of a sudden it just, it's when the time's right, um, things work together. Uh, I always say things happen for a reason and this, this worked out and it's worked out for the better. Um, so. so I've only seen your uh, your seed packaging for, say, like the last uh, three seasons or so, um, and and the artwork, I mean, it's it's pulled together, right? We'll talk more about packaging itself in, in a couple minutes, but like as far as like the graphic design of your brand, you know, you can tell when I see a pack of seeds, I can tell it's yours. It, your stuff has all got a similar um, aesthetic to it. Is that something that you developed yourself, or do you work closely with a graphic designer who's helping you know you kind of line all this stuff up? Uh, a little bit of both, actually. You know, so let me let me answer that in a few different ways. So originally, the DVG logo, my shield logo, and the script logo that has become so popular that's on every one of my packaging, on my clothing, and everything was actually done by the breeder at Bay Exclusives. Oh. My buddy who uh, uh, Bay Exclusive Seeds or Bay Exclusive Genetics out of Oregon, he he worked with me very closely. He's a good friend of mine. He designed the DVG logo for me, and we kind of talked about it, and he helped me get, the, get that going. So he did that logo for me, and then everything after that, I worked – uh, very closely with with uh, a graphic artist I have locally, um, and then he does all the printing. Excuse me, but then uh, the, my designer is actually uh, 420 Friendly Illustrations, and he's the guy that's been doing a lot of my art recently, and has helped with my Citrus Farmer logo, the Doctor Gonzo, the Full Metal Jacket, and he'll continue to uh, help me with these designs. He's he's an incredible uh, artist with with crazy uh, talent. It's nice, so. too, that you can get people that have got mad talent freelance, right? Because, like, you know, yeah. when a company gets big enough, sure, you can bring designers in-house. But um, but it's nice to be able to to work with somebody who that you respect and produces good work, but not necessarily have to pay them for all of their time. You can pay them for the time that you need them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, if you had a full-time artist on deck that was sitting there and always – I mean, I would be paying so much stinking money, but – uh, what it really comes down to is each design this guy does it's he's doing he's doing a ton of work for other people so when i need something done i give him some notice in advance we we sit there we talk about what the concept is and then we shoot back and forth ideas and i swear it's like by the time it's done it's like get out of my head you you he literally it's so perfect and it's so exactly what i wanted to represent that i couldn't i couldn't ask for a better um um artist really Right on, good. That's an awesome shout out. So, hey, let's go ahead and take our first short break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Eric Wimber, founder of Dungeons Vault Genetics. As a listener of Shaping Fire, you already understand the importance of living soil when growing cannabis. When you have active microbe communities in your substrate, you go way beyond simply fertilizing with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Having active microorganisms in your substrate supports vigorous plant growth throughout the plant's root zone, making for higher yields and thriving flowers. Mammoth pea is the first organically derived microbial inoculant that focuses on your plant's nutrient cycling processes to release soil phosphorus and other micronutrients from their bound forms, making them more available to the plant. Increased levels of phosphorus will also keep inner nodes shorter and focus your plant's energy on bud production. 
Not only that, but the microbes act as a defense shield for the plant's rhizosphere by outcompeting potentially harmful pathogenic microbes. Pretty cool, right? Mammoth pea not only unlocks the nutrients in your soil, but it also helps protect your plant from disease. Mammoth pea's beneficial bacteria act like microbioreactors, continually producing enzymes that release nutrients. Mammoth pea was developed at a U.S. university and has been extensively tested by Colorado growers and independent laboratories. Mammoth pea is proven to increase growth and enhance blooming. One of the great things about supplementing with microorganisms is that they won't compete with whatever fertilizer program you're already running. Simply dose on top of your fertilizer schedule for increased benefits. To learn more and to find out where you can buy Mammoth Pea near you, check out their website at www.mammothmicrobes.com. Partner with microorganisms to create beautiful, thriving cannabis. Mammoth Pea. Join me at the upcoming CanMed event in Los Angeles for a gathering of the top minds in cannabis medicine. Field experts will present their latest findings and best practices in treating a variety of conditions with cannabis, including epilepsy, pain, traumatic brain injury, cancer, autism, and more. Laboratory professionals will share their revolutionary technologies in cannabinoid and terpenoid extraction, delivery methods, and quality and safety testing. CanMed 2018 is October 22nd through 24th at the Luskin Conference Center at UCLA. And while the final speakers list is still coming together, the speakers who are already announced give you plenty of reasons to get your ticket today. Prepare yourself to learn from 54 thought leader presentations focused on furthering the convergence of medical cannabis research, treatment, and product development. Speakers include the father of cannabis research, Raphael Meshulam. Michael Dorr, chief medical consultant for the Israeli Ministry of Health, will be there too. The list of esteemed speakers participating is long and includes shaping fire guests, cannabis neuroscientist Dr. Ethan Russo, and Kevin McKiernan of Medicinal Genomics. You can view all the speakers at canmedevents.com. This year's CanMed features a special education track on the application of blockchain technology in the cannabis market, including cannabis banking, seed-to-sale tracking, sequencing the cannabis genome, ICO financing, and more. If you are a medical care provider, be sure to arrive a day early to participate in the pre-conference CME course. Find out more about that at canmedevents.com. That's C-A-N-N-M-E-D events.com. 95% of attendees said CanMed 2017 met or exceeded their expectations. That's a serious vote of confidence that CanMed 2018 will be well worth your time and resources. So don't delay. Visit CanMedEvents.com today to reserve your seat and find out more. Welcome back. You're listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Los, and our guest this week is Eric Wimber, founder of Dungeons Vault Genetics. So, you know, during the first set, we were talking a lot about how uh, Dungeons Vault came into being and what your motivations are around the brand and everything. But, you know, most of the time when I see you, Eric, you are working a booth at a at a cannabis event somewhere. And, and you know, part of that, I, I mean, it's kind of like the Eric Wimber show, right? Because you got a big personality. <laughs> People are there because like they follow you on Instagram and they want to, you know, they want to see you in the flesh, you know, because because people are into their cannabis. And and so you seem like you have to put out a hell of a lot of energy when you're working. I mean, just selling seeds itself, working a booth itself is exhausting. But since you're the guy that a lot of people are there to see, you seem to have to like work double. How, how grueling is that? Man, it's, I tell you, it, you wouldn't think that just standing there, or even if I'm sitting down, just sitting there at the, an event to sit there and tell people, oh my God, I'm so, I'm so tired from the, like you stood there and talked to people and smoked weed all day. How fucking bad is that? Really? It sounds pretty easy to me, but uh, really when you are talking to that many people, I mean, I've never done a, a count on how many people come through a booth or even at those events, but there's enough there that by the end of the day, um, I've barely left the booth enough to go use a restroom or, or get myself something to drink really quick. Or, um, I, yeah, that's, that's really, I don't get to walk around very much. My voice is gone by the end of the day or by the end of the weekend. But I, I, I did, I made this brand by myself 
I, I do a lot of this stuff with friends. If, if you see people at the booth, they're usually friends of mine or guys that I work with, a tester who I've become great friends with who show up at these the events and help me out. But for the most part, I do everything myself, and I like to talk to the people. Um, I like to be the one behind the booth selling the seeds. I like to do everything. I have my hands on everything and, and know what's being said because I want my company represented in a good way, and I want people to walk away knowing that they had their questions answered and or that they have all the knowledge they needed when they made that purchase. I mean, let's be real here. No matter how much money you make, if you're spending any sort of amount of money on seeds, not only are you investing um, that money, that you, it's harder in money, but you are going to invest a lot of time into those things. So you want to know anything that you want to know about that strain should be answered at that booth by a knowledgeable staff. And if I don't have someone there that I know can answer that um, question with 100 um, percent confidence, then I'll be right there standing behind them helping um, anything I can. Do you find that the kind of questions that people ask you at the booth are almost entirely about the the seeds and cannabis botany and how to grow them and various those kind of specifics, or do you find that that actually, you know, that's a lesser amount of the questions and lots of people actually want to like you know get selfies with you and just talk shop or or get you know tell you tell you how much they love Citrus Farmer like like how much of it is like people like really needing to know that kind of information. It's it's a little bit it's mixed because you have people that come by you get you get the mom and pop that have literally now that cannabis has become so um, accepted they are finally making their way to an event They're like wow I've never done this before can you tell me a little bit about your seeds or oh I didn't even know they sold these things or whether they've heard of them or not they might come by excuse me <clears throat> and they want to have a little conversation about how you know you know seeds have become so popular and how people are growing them to the the novice farmer to the guy that just yeah they do want advice they want to know everything that's going on with the strains and you know how i grow and what's my choice uh for nutrients all that stuff and then yeah you got the people that come by that are fans you know the instagram fans or people that are just you know buddies and and people you've seen at different shows and they come by to say hello and and, and shake your hand or and you just stop by and smoke a joint but that's that gets into the whole thing you asked earlier I'm so busy at those booths talking to people and trying to make sure everything's flowing correctly that I rarely have time to – I mean even when you came by last time, I was trying I, – I could see you standing there. I want to say hi to you, but I'm in the middle of a conversation and how rude to just walk away from a conversation and, and then ignore that person. So I have to do everything I can to make sure everyone feels respected and that they are being um, taken care of. And then I can step away and say hello to someone or try and talk to some people. So at times it can be hard because I've only got a couple of people working my booth with me and sometimes I – I would really rather be the one talking. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And and certainly when I see you at events, I know that your job there is to sell, you know? And 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 when and when you you know, you didn't have time for me immediately, I did a loop and I came back and you had more time and you know, we said hey then. But I think yeah. that I think it's important for people who are uh, you know, who are who are fans but not particularly planning on buying that day, they have to understand that they need to like step aside so that the person who's got, you know, a $100 bill in their hand uh, gets your attention because that's you know that's that's why the whole thing can continue is because that sale is going to happen you know yes yes and that's part of the reason why I I made these laminated menus now so I can just when I'm talking to someone I can see out the corner of my eye that someone wants to talk to me or someone wants to ask a question so I can just very very politely hand them my menu so they can see what's going on and they can hopefully have a question answered that I can continue to uh, show this other person the respect they deserve and and continue their uh, conversation until they walk away but yeah. I, I agree with you. If, if we can just try and uh, shuttle the people that want to talk aside and let the people that are looking to buy in another aisle, that's that's what I should be doing. But, you know, it's it's nice to talk to everyone. You always see fans and friends from, from every show, so it's cool. So so I know that, you know, the, the, the shows on the West Coast are chill and pretty easy, but I'm assuming that you spend a lot of time in the newer states as well, like, you know, Michigan, for example. And, uh, um, you know, how sketchy is it going into some of these newer states carrying, you know, not only all of your product to sell at the event, but also like, you know, your personal stash, because, I, you know, you're clearly not going to be, you know, m you know, have a medical card in all these uh, states. States and the laws are changing. I would think that with you know everything that all the you know everything on the line that that could get pretty sketched sometimes. I I've got a few stories from airports that are pretty comical, but yeah, no, for the most part, they they really don't 
seeds are really they don't care tsa and and most other people have have made it very clear that that's not something they're concerned with so me traveling with seeds so far hasn't been an issue um i would say once you start bringing you know certain amounts of of weed with you on the plane or whatever you might want to be careful but for the most part i kind of leave all that shit behind and let people know hey i'm traveling from another state so the reason i don't have 10 jars with a quarter pound in each jar so you can smell everything and make a judgment on what you want to buy is because a i don't want to go to jail for this (laughs) and it's just not it's just not logical it's just there's really no way to do it so unless i'm driving across state lines and even then, same thing. I can't be bringing weed across state lines that way either. So it's really, uh, it's funny, man. You got to really build your brand and let people know what you got because if they're if they're counting on smelling a jar to make their 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 choice, it's gonna be hard for them. But um, yeah, it's 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 so far for me going to the other states has been incredible. I mean, Michigan, honestly, one of my favorite places to go. They, they, I'm so well received there, and I've got nothing but love for Michigan. Those guys show me so much support out there, um, even more so than any other state. Honestly, I think more than California, more than Oregon, more than more than Colorado, um, Michigan has my back and is is a huge supporter of all things Dungeons Vault. So big shout out to Michigan farmers. Right on, right on. And, and you know, uh, it, it's funny, too, because, you know, so many of us on the West Coast between, you know, having medical for almost 20 years, depending on where you are on the West Coast, um, you know, a lot of us have gotten used to what it's like to be around easily accessible top shelf uh, weed and, and, you know, feeling generally safe that we're not going to get in trouble. But, you know, I, I'm actually from Michigan. So, like, when I go home to visit my family and I see uh, friends from back in the day and, uh, you know, the fact that they now have got you know more advanced medical and they're getting you know cool products out there um to to see it reflected in their eyes being so recently out of prohibition it reminds me to be grateful that i live on the west coast and that i've even taken some of this stuff for granted at this point because i'm around it every day but you know you go back behind the prohibition curtain and people are all like man i can't even believe i can buy this stuff legally you know yeah, no, it's 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 times are changing. It wasn't it wasn't long ago that I was arrested for a possession of marijuana charge here in Washington state. And I remember asking the state trooper, I said, man, you guys are crazy. When are you going to just fucking legalize this stuff? And he said, not anytime soon, buddy. Well, that wasn't that long ago. And here we are. So <laughs> it's it's pretty funny. So, you know, we were talking about the, the, the laws around the seeds and, and that the TSA really doesn't care all that much. And, um, you know, People in the you know in the olden days, like five years ago, um, uh, w- you know they they didn't want to ship seeds into the U.S. and then people in the U.S. didn't really want to ship seeds from state to state. But now, like lots of people are mailing seeds, and and you know a lot, a lot of people I, I ask like why do you feel safe doing that? And they're like, oh, our seeds are you know for souvenir only, which doesn't seem like it would be a hustle that would necessarily stand up in court. Like what I- what are the rules around? Uh, uh, shipping and selling seeds. Are you really at any risk? It the great question. It is. It is very, very strange because you've got so many different people with an opinion on on the legalities of it and how you know, like how it all is playing out and you don't even know what to think, you know, because you got, you got one person saying, you know, it's, it's agricultural trash. Seeds are not looked at as, as an item that is, it's, it shouldn't be, it's not illegal, you know, but then you got other people that are saying, for instance, at Canacon this last, a couple of few weeks ago, um, the cannabis liquor control board came in and they were saying that, you know, seed sales in Washington state is illegal, um, to, to have seeds on my, on my table, was essentially the same as having marijuana displayed. Wow. I mean, very, very strict when it comes to the whole recreational side of it because I think they're really after the whole seed to sale thing and they want to make sure that, you know, they're getting theirs. But it's very weird because at the same time, they're telling me that it's illegal and this and that, blah, blah, blah. But I've personally been told and seen it written on paper that seeds do not have THC in them and therefore are not illegal and are, like I said earlier, considered trash and or a souvenir or whatever you like to do with it. But um, seed sales, I think, has increased so much because, like you mentioned, before, five years ago, even more than that maybe, was you, you, 
if you weren't ordering your seeds from Attitude Seed Bank or from, say, Irby's Head Shop or wherever you were, wherever you were getting them from, there was all of our sources were were overseas. And then, unless you knew a private breeder here in town, um, you know, you could get some stuff. But the, the varieties and all the hybrids and everything that has come out is is over the top. It's it's absolutely crazy. And I would say that we are we are very lucky to have so many talented people in one um, area that we can actually get what we are getting. Cause now what, <laughs> why, why would you ever order seeds from another country at this point? I mean, what you're going to half the people get their seeds taken from customs and then ha- who's to say you're even getting what you're paying for. I mean, that's, that's really any seed bank you order from, but we have guys with great reputations here. So it's just why risk it anywhere else? Yeah, totally. We've got mad, mad talent here in the States now. Um, So before we go to our second break, I want to uh, ask you about, you know, you have got a really um, rabid following, you know, your followers are hardcore and, and, you know, sometimes things can get uh, pretty rambunctious on your Instagram, for example, right? (laughs) And, um, you know, how, how, how does that play into, you know, your, your bigger work, right? Because like, you know, Essentially, that is part of your advertising, right? And so you're participating with people, and yeah, you're teaching them about your product, but also, you know, you get you get like these jerks who show up, and then suddenly people who's defending you, and so like this 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 if this thing explodes on your Instagram feed. How do you you know how do you what's your perspective on that? Do you see that as just being like healthy and fun, or do you do you try to have there not be much of it because? Um, because you know, when you've got what eighty four thousand followers and and everybody is passionate, it tends to happen often. You know what? It's 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 a. Uh, uh, I kind of got into this earlier with you, but it's 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 weird because I want to be the guy who's. I'm not going to turn my cheek and get slapped again, you know. But at the same time, I think there's there is a point where you need to just kind of step back. And 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 either diffuse the situation or just delete everything entirely. And I have done that. I, I mean, the, what the example you brought up? There's a few times where I can think of where I, there was a post made or there was something said, and it led into just some hundred plus comments thing. And yeah, or I've got attack uh, people that follow me attacking other people, and then people just trolling me hard. And in all reality, what good is it? None. But it does get me some uh, some uh, 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 more people paying attention to the page than other people. Next thing you know, I got I got more followers that are looking at things. So sometimes it gets good. It can be a curse and a blessing. But but I think for the most part, it's probably better to just keep your nose out of that shit and just let the let the troll pages and the meme pages handle all the huge arguments, and you just kind of represent your brand. That's that's more of the. Uh, line i'm trying to take as of recently but at the same time i'm i'm a very passionate person i'm a very friendly guy but i'm also someone who's got you know a little bit of uh um you know anger issues here and there so i can easily lose my cool and say things i don't mean or maybe i do mean it at the time but just say things that might come across another person is a real jerky thing to say but in all reality i'm really just i'm not gonna let people walk on me I, I, I can appreciate the people that can, you know, let's let's all just get along and let's just all smoke a joint and go hug a tree. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, sometimes people just need to get put in their place and, and be told that, you know, it don't – it's just your comment was unnecessary and I don't want to freaking hear it. And then you got my – the followers that they will literally go – and I'm not telling them, I'm not telling people to go do these things. And they will literally go and just light a fire under someone's ass. And it's like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I would – you you had – I had no idea the outcome of what some of these things are going to do. But it's just – it's it's comical at times. But, yeah, like I said, if I see something – and for the most part, I don't leave that kind of stuff up on my page. I'll, I'll let it go for a little bit. I'll speak my mind. I'll say what I need to say. And then, boom, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I came up with a term for uh, that that I use with uh, clients a lot. I call it a, a spectacle marketing, right? <laughs> it, it, it's, 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 you know, it's something that happens. Like like a master of this is uh, Jonah Tacoma <clears throat> from Dab Stars, right? Like, oh, yeah. like he does these big things that are just like crazy and outrageous and, and, and people all want to watch it because it's like a house on fire or something, right? And, yeah. he, and, and he gets everybody excited and he milks it and then he just moves on to the next thing, right? And sometimes Sometimes these these online fights can be the same thing. It'd be like, oh my god, I can't believe like so. And you kind of follow the thread throughout the day, and then you know, as long as nobody 
gets truly violent with each other, you know, you can always just delete it down the line and, and move on. Exactly. And that's, that's really what I've tried to do because I think that sometimes when I post something, whether it be drama related or I'm, I'm calling someone out for doing something stupid or whatever it may be, I want people to see what I have to say, but then it doesn't need to just be a, a, a ongoing thing. Once I've spoken my mind or I've said what I want to say and, and enough people have commented or seen it, then they can go tell their friends or whatever that what they saw, it's done at that point. I mean, I, I, I don't think anyone should just be allowed to be off you know, let off the hook for stuff, stuff they do or say. If you've said or done something that's really faulty, then own up to it. And if it's if you're going to get called out on social media, you know what I mean? Then that's it. That's just that's how it is nowadays. So be ready. So keep your nose clean and don't say things you don't mean. Or or if you're going to say things you don't that you do mean, then get ready to back them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. So so, so it's, um, it's it's, it's funny. So so after after no, the br- I, I was just yeah, it's funny. Yeah, after after the break, um, oh, I want to we're going to talk more about your particular uh, strain lineage. But but one more question before we go to that break, you know, um, I I have heard you talk about testers a lot, um, about you know the kind of attributes that you like in a tester and the kind of people that deserve to receive test seeds, and then and then all the yahoos that just waste your seeds and you never hear from them again. So you know, there's there's clearly a lot of people who are listening today who would love to be a tester for you or for somebody else, right? You know, what what do you see as being the attributes of a good tester and how should somebody approach a, a breeder so that they get, you know, so they start off on the right foot? I have literally gone about this in so many ways that I don't even know. I At this point, I, I'm going to start doing face-to-face interviews. Like I don't, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, but I literally don't, I don't know what to do because I've tried it. I've, I've literally done it this way where I, I look at someone and I say, okay, this guy's got X amount of followers. He obviously has people checking out his page. He grows good weed. He, he's very, um, he's very, uh, you know, he, he's on Instagram a lot. He's, he's spent a lot of time on there and showing people what he's doing. So that's the kind of person I would think would be my ideal tester in, and I say, I think with in parentheses because that's really uh that's what i thought would be good then you got guys that have a very very low following with you know hardly any followers at all but they grow killer bud and all they are trying to do is is get their foot in the door so they can hopefully one day um you know be more like a permanent tester or be have some sort of uh uh, way to get into this industry and if being someone's grower and and helping them test strains and all of a sudden you they've i've used 10 of that guy's photos on my page to advertise for my brand guess what he's probably made it into a spot where i will always hit him up maybe even invite him out for a cup to come hang out and you know come re- meet the guys and and really you know get get more strains to grow out himself or whatever but I'm looking to build relationships with these people. You know, I don't want I don't want some some girl or guy, <clears throat> excuse me, um, growing for me and, and me never even knowing who they are. Just having some online persona. I want to know who you are. I want to engage with you. I want to know how they're growing. I want to know what you have got going on. And it seems to me that there's too many people that are they are so quick to jump in line. Oh, I want to test for you. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll. They promise everything from the moon and back, and then they don't do what they say they're going to do. Now there are there are circumstances that happen, and, and you gotta you know be understanding because everybody doesn't have an easy life. There's things that pop up, things happen. You know, there's all sorts of, of stuff out of our control. But what I see happening more times than not is is people asking and or begging for seeds, and then they don't even do anything with them. They they put them in their stash, or maybe they do grow them, but they don't ever tell me about it because they just wanted something new. So they have something that sets them apart from their their friend who's growing. You know something that everyone already has right now. Yeah. So it's, I, I very, can see, it's very weird. S- yeah. And, and probably super hella frustrating too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Hey, let's go ahead and take that break. Uh, we're going to take a short break and be right back. You're listening to shaping fire. And my guest today is Eric Wimber, founder of dungeons vault genetics. Using pesticides when growing cannabis has been common for a long time. Nowadays though, we know better. We know that most pesticides formulated for food crops have never been tested for use with cannabis. They've been tested to be eaten in tiny doses. They have not been tested to be inhaled and especially not concentrated into a cannabis oil. Chemical residues from pesticides are not healthy for anyone, but they are especially dangerous for patients. For commercial cannabis growers, this has become very impactful. 
Cannabis enthusiasts and patients have gotten educated enough that they avoid growers who used pesticides. Not only that, but states across the country have begun making pesticide testing mandatory on all licensed cannabis crops. The time has come to find a better way to fight garden pests than covering your cannabis in chemicals. And there is a better way. Let some good bugs fight your bad bugs. Beneficial insects and predatory mites have come a long way since we were buying ladybugs online and putting them in the grow room and just hoping for the best. Natural enemies biocontrol can help you solve pest issues without using chemicals. Natural Enemies founder Shane Young learned best practices from working in the ornamental plant industry and has fine-tuned those strategies specifically for large cannabis crops. Shane works with commercial cannabis clients across the country to ensure that they keep their crops safe and pest-free without the use of chemicals. Natural Enemies has proven solutions for spider mites, aphids, thrips, russet mites, broad mites, shore flies, Whitefly, and others too. You can rely on natural enemies for expertise and excellent service. For more information, go to shapingfire.com forward slash natural enemies or simply click on their banner in this week's newsletter. If you grow cannabis with sunshine, you can often feel limited by the seasonal cycle. You want to grow sustainably and save money, so you use as little electricity as possible. But if you haven't studied or implemented light deprivation techniques into your greenhouse, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. By incorporating light deprivation solutions into your greenhouse, you can often add two or three additional growing cycles to your year. When you pencil out the financial benefit of those additional cycles, you'll realize why commercial scale light deprivation technology is remaking the cannabis industry. What used to be done by pulling tarps over hoop houses has been scaled up over the last few years in such a way that it's become mechanized, easy, and affordable to even small-scale commercial cannabis operations. Forever Flowering Greenhouses is the industry leader in light deprivation, greenhouse design and operation for the commercial cannabis industry. Their team of greenhouse experts have been in the fields of Northern California for decades, and they're now building greenhouses for commercial cannabis companies across the country. If you are new to light depth and growing in greenhouses, I encourage you to go back to Shaping Fire episode 13 with guest Eric Branstad of Forever Flowering. I talk with Eric about the importance of intelligent greenhouse management as well as the huge financial benefit of incorporating light depth techniques. There are so many aspects of utilizing a greenhouse that can go wrong. From temperature and airflow to light depth and workflow, Forever Flowering will help you produce crop after crop of well cared for flowers. They can help you retrofit your existing greenhouse with light depth and other modern systems at a level that fits your budget. If you're just starting out, Forever Flowering can help you plan and build your new greenhouse so that you get started on the right foot. The cannabis business has enough risks without trying to go it alone with your greenhouse. Contact Forever Flowering Greenhouses to partner with folks who have an indisputable reputation as knowledgeable and easy to work with. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash FFG to find out more. Welcome back. You're listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shangalos, and our guest this week is Eric Wimber, founder of Dungeons Vault Genetics. So, you know, up to this point, we've talked a lot about how someone would start a seed company and, and a lot of the, you know, the goods and the bads that you went through to get to where you are. Um, I want to focus this last set uh, specifically on the gear that you put out because it's, it's fabulous. I've grown it myself. I, I love, uh, you know, actually, I love everything I've, I've grown. And, you know, a lot of that, I think, has to do with the fact that uh, uh, you really rely a lot on this fabulous grandpa's breath strain as what seems like your dominant male that you work with. How did you find the grandpa's breath? And, and you know, where did, it, where did your love affair with that plant start? So when I was still working with granddaddy, um, I had came to Ken because everything with that brand was obviously based on the on the GDP. Grandpa's granddaddy, grandpa, anything like that it was all had to do with the the marketing for that company. So I originally told him, "Hey, there's this there's this clone going around. It's very held back. It's not passed to too many people. It's very exclusive." And it was the OG Kush Breath, and we're talking we're talking back in like 09, 2010. No, excuse me, it was a little bit after that. I'm wrong. But either way, it was it was it, it was, was early going anyway. Yeah, yeah, it was it was early on in in this in the stages of of my breeding that that this OGKB started getting passed around. I have friends 
in California that looked after me and were very good to me. And, and I'm not going to mention his name, but he's a really good dude. He's very well known in the cannabis industry. And he, he gave me clones because he knew I, that, you know, I was good people. I wasn't going to do anything bad with them. And he, he trusted me with them. So he gave them to me. I used them. I knew what I was doing. And OGKB to me was, that was the best cookie. It was, it was such a good smell. It was, it was very rare. And it was just one of those ones that if you had it, you, you, you had something others didn't. So, I mean, Gage Green, myself, and maybe one or two other people, very few of us had that clone. And we were the first to bring any of these breath strains to uh, the market. Um, I don't care what anyone says. I could argue till night about, you know, it was Gage Green with their Mendo breath and the uh, Grateful breath. And then I shortly came after, Shorty was out with the uh, Grandpa's breath right after that. And I knew from the start of the mail when I, when I first crossed the OGKB with the Tahoe GDP, I knew immediately once I found this mail, this thing was so um, just stout and it had – I mean, it, it, it made the last males that I found when I was working with Grandy look like nothing. I mean, it just really, um, I knew it was going to be good. Um, and then as I continued forth my project, I, I saw what was coming out of it and everything that I saw tested and grown out was incredible. So it was really just something special. And that's really why it was used in everything. Cause rather than using too many strains and having a bunch of, um, stuff that I'm not certain is going to be great i found something special and i knew that's what i was going to base everything off of and so that's what i did it, the uh <clears throat> the grandpa's breath has got something for everybody too because you know uh people have asked me before um like like, like I, I i really like the foul mouth right and so so people ask me to describe the the grandpa's breath and i'm all like well you know it's 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 fuely but it's got some floral in there uh but it, but it's got some of those like old school alcohol esters like skunk does. Um, and so people are like, so it essentially, you know, tastes like and smells like everything. I'm like, well, yeah, I guess it kind of does. You know, it's, it's, it's not one of these strains that you're pigeonholed into, <clears throat> um, one descriptor. It's not one thing. It's actually a lot of things. And, yeah. and one of the cool things about F1s is that, um, you can play, you, you get to experience, you get to treasure hunt Finos still. Um, and, and I enjoy that aspect of it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's from what I will say that I've noticed for sure with this male, no matter what it's touched, you still get, um, you still get dominance from the, from the female half. But that male brings so much frost and so much kind of like almost like an earthiness and berries is kind of what I would describe. Because everything in there, you there's always kind of a grapey, um, musky, berry thing going on in, in some of the phenos, no matter which what you grow. But uh, there's always going to be the dominant you know, female phenotype that comes in. But yeah, like you said, there's a little bit of something for everybody because – People like the purple. You get that. The bag of pill is there with every strain. Doesn't matter what you choose. And then the um, some people they they what's your biggest yielder? There's quite a few that actually yield quite well. And surprisingly, because of having the Girl Scout and then the OG and GDP, you don't think those three strains together are going to create something that yields heavy. But surprisingly enough, it does. And it's it's many uh, growers who have tried my strains out have reported back. Um, above average yields even. So once these, once these strains get dialed in and you know what you're doing with them, I mean, you, they can really be uh, rewarding in so many levels. Yeah, it was probably a lot of fun too for when, you know, not, once your seeds started hitting the street and people who you did not know personally. So, so obviously your, your friends and your inner circle were growing your gear. But when people start to report back beyond your sphere of influence that they're growing your stuff and really liking it, there's got to be a lot of self satisfaction in knowing that other people are digging on, on your, on your baby, you know? Oh, absolutely. Like uh, my, my first years in with can and all that stuff, I was seeing people bringing me samples to the shows and Hey, this is your purple champagne. Hey, this is the, this is the grand OG. This is this, this is that. And I was super stoked. I was, I was, I was happy with what I was seeing. I, I felt pretty cool. It, it, you know, a little pat on my own back, you know, like I made that that's, that's, that's really cool. You know, it was my, it was a dream and now it's come true. But what I've noticed now with this grandpa's breath line, um, it doesn't matter what you bring by. I am so impressed with every single sample that gets brought to my table. And I'm always so happy and so excited to see the next one that someone has because it's always been um, – it's it's very rewarding feeling. But not only that, it's, it's just cool because this is what I've always wanted to do. I've wanted to 
make strains that I would be happy to smoke and stuff that I mean to be sitting there smoking on a strain that I created and knowing that I'm not you know I'm I'm not just smoking it because I create I'm smoking it because I enjoy it and that's something I would actually recommend to other people to try not just not just to uh, create a sale but because hey this is good weed um it, it's it's pretty good feeling I gotta admit yeah I, I love it and every single time I hear from someone that they enjoy my strains it's just another you know huge uh, blessing because you know I know I'm doing something right. One of the far out things I think for being a breeder versus a big, uh, you know, commercial production grower is that you're winning cups, cannabis cups, but like you're not winning them. It's it's the people who have bought your gear who are then winning the cups, and so you know your work is winning the cup put together with their work. Um, that must be a strange feeling. What, what was it like the first time that one of your strains won a cup that someone else grew? That that was insane because it wasn't just one cup. This guy, um, he goes by the name Big Worm online. He literally, he makes incredible oil, but he was over in Massachusetts uh, is where he's based out of. But um, he he got, he placed at the secret cup for the East Coast, or for, I don't remember where it was at, but he placed at the Secret Cup, made it to the finals, and then with my Citrus Farmer strain, he literally swept the competition. I mean, he won in one night, best overall, highest terps, and best shatter. Um, <laughs> I mean, in one night, and that was all first place awards for Citrus Farmer, and then I got to smoke the oil shortly thereafter, and it, I, I mean, absolutely burnt orange just absolute dank it was so good and i it, it, talk about feeling feeling really cool and, and having a uh a, a, a moment that's that was it for me i was like that's that's awesome to know that people are are that impressed with the strain and it's coming out that that good and people are are really uh you know positive reviews it it, it makes me feel really good um, you know, and, and in the end, it is also a business. So I'm assuming that once people started winning cups with your gear, that that really helped at the box office too, right? Because suddenly people are all like, wow, I hadn't heard of that strain. They look it up and suddenly they're on your IG and now they're trying to totally connect with you at, a, at an event or something to buy the seeds. That probably makes all the difference in the world when, when your stuff starts winning awards. Oh yeah, Tangy, Tangy with Crockett and DNA, those guys blew up with that strain. I can't say for certain that that's the first orange strain I've ever had. Orange strains have been around for years and years, but they kind of, they kind of uh, really set the standard for orange strains, right? So when I was given my Skunk Tangerine cut from Oregon Kid, um, that one is one that is so, it's so held back. Not very few people have that clone. So the amount of breeders working with it is mm, two. Me and Archive Seeds is the only people that I have it as far as I'm concerned. I haven't seen anyone else using it. No one else is working with it. And it had such a strong smell. Um, it, it was incredible. And I knew right then and there that that was going to be something that um, – as soon as people saw it and smelt it and got to see what they were going to get from my seeds, they were going to, it was going to be popular. We released uh, citrus farmer at the Emerald cup in 2015, I believe. And it sold out that weekend. So then it was not even, let's see, that was December, 2015. So I think, yeah, later on in the year, 2016 was when, when citrus farmer really blew up. It won four awards. So it won those three, at Secret Cup for the Shatter, and then the week after that, it won um, at a another event over in Maine or on the East Coast for the Flower. It won third place overall. So it really started making waves, and even to this day, everyone that grows it has has left back left me such positive feedback and has really enjoyed it. It's been very well reviewed. I know that like <clears throat> trying to choose your your favorite strain uh, is like trying to you know choose a favorite child or something. But is there yeah. a part is there a particular strain um, in in your line that you feel especially warm to? Like that like you know maybe it's maybe it's the first cup or maybe it's something that that you know was especially difficult for you to run. That man, it's such. It's like you said. It's like trying to choose your favorite child. How do you say that? You make sure they're not looking when you say it. But I mean, really, it's it's since they can't hear me, I would say that if I had to choose overall, if I'm left on an island with one strain to smoke, fuck, that's so hard. But I would say hot rod. Oh, right on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my that or the or the ones that are sold out, my swamp thing or lost soul, anything OG Kim 
sour flavor, anything that's you crack that jar and you can smell it across the room. That's that's what I'm after. So we have found so much gas out of the hot rod that that really was that that to me is probably my go to favorite. But the grandpa's breath, man, very very like right there. I've been smoking on grandpa's breath the past two days and. I love that strain. It works out so well for me for sleep and for everything. It's just a very heavy narcotic high, and I I really enjoy it. So, um, but hot rod just because of the the taste, the terps, the smell, overall everything about it. It's just it's really what I'm after when I when it comes to what I choose for my cannabis strain on a daily. I really like the the fuel. So. It seems like you have, I mean, everybody does, you know, limited runs, right? But it seems oh, yeah. like you have really gone pro with with how you're doing the limited runs. And for, for anybody who did not, who wasn't at Emerald Cup this year, this is pretty much how it went down. You know, you had you had these these trials. I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of telling your story for you, but you, you had these trials that, <laughs> that, that you weren't sure if you were going to go all the way with. And so, and so, like, what, 48 hours before Emerald Cup opens up, you drop photos of these crosses on uh, on Instagram which like freaks all your fans out everybody's like oh my god and so like as as the morning first morning of emerald cup and people are like sipping on their coffee and like stretching and stuff you've already got a line from the front of your booth you know 45 people you know deep and everybody else is like, what the fuck's going on over there, right? And and because I follow you on IG, I'm like, ah, well, you know, everybody wants to get the limited edition stuff. Were you surprised at how successful the marketing was for those limited editions? You have no idea. Like me and my buddy that I drove down there with, we sat there over dinner and we're having a drink one, the night before Emerald Cup. Um, or maybe it was, maybe it was that Thursday night. So we were going to set up the next morning one way or another. We're sitting there thinking, we're like, you know, how should we do this? You know I mean? Do I want to, you know what I mean? Do I want to just tell people, you know, what I ended up doing was I told people the, how limited they were, how the fact that there's only so many packs available. And I, and I, what I did was I actually opened it up to, to some people before the show. So I made it even more exclusive by offering people, if you can pay now and you want to pre-buy it, go right ahead, you know, send me the money. It'll be waiting for you. And then, so I did that and I, I literally had so many messages and so many people automatically wanted to pay that I, I just was like, wow, I had no idea it was going to blow up like this. So as that morning came that Saturday morning, like you mentioned, there were so many people already waiting there. I wasn't even set up yet, and people were standing there with cash. I like, can I buy this? Can I buy that? I'm like, I'm not even. Hold on one sec. Let me get let me get this stuff out. I'm, not even, I'm just setting up, but it was absolutely incredible. And we took video because I've never been that busy ever at any show where I had that many people waiting in line. Like I'm dropping the next iPhone or something. <laughs> uh, so so the, those seeds that were all your limited editions are, do you think that you're going to move forward with all of those or were those just, you know, fun things that you figured on the side and, you know, um, you just, you just wanted to get them out, but you're not going to move down the road with them. A lot of people, it's funny. I mentioned archive really. He made a joke one time where he made a meme about it. Uh, there was, you know, it was like the breeders list to, you know, like what, what the, what that really like. So some people will say limited edition means totally untested, uh, you know, high priced, you know, BS, just some, some breeder wants to put something out real quick. That wasn't the case here. What happened was I had a run where I fully intended on there being a hell of a lot more seeds than there were that the, 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 the male just didn't put out as much pollen as I was hoping it would have. And Overall, I think what what really happened was I I miscalculated my run days. I'm telling on myself right here, but let's just keep it real with everybody. Um, I I pulled I think a week early, and so some of the seeds weren't even as fully developed as they should have been. So I was like, oh shit! So when it was all said and done, and I counted stuff, there was some where it was like, I want this strain released because this is too good not to release it. And after testing it, we knew that we had some killer stuff, but there was not as much numbers as I normally would have. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to put them up there. People that want them, it's going to be a limited edition. Get them while they're hot. You know, it's 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 up to you. If you want them, great. If not, no big deal. And sure enough, I mean, I, they were very well accepted and everybody was super stoked to get in line and get some of them. So I would say that uh, I would like all of them to be something in my line that comes back. But at this point, what I'm starting to realize is, and I don't think a lot of people realize this either, is I'm working very – uh, exclusively, you know, on certain things, it's very, it's, it's, I'm doing things, um, 
alone. I don't have a I don't have a huge team I'm working with. I'm not I don't have a gigantic facility I'm breeding out of, so I don't have unlimited numbers when it comes to these things. I don't have I don't have a hundred different rooms to make all these different strains. So what what it comes down to is I do more or less um kind of boutique runs and boutique drops and and now that's how it's going to be like if you if you're in if you're in that line and you get a hold of them then great because that i really mean it they're limited as in i might it might be another year or two before i remake them so it's one of those things like i've got so many great ones that i've now released and have become popular off of but now you know what i mean people are asking for certain ones to come back and i've got so many other ones i need to do and then trying to stay relevant and make new strains it's it's overwhelming at times and that's another thing you asked her about people wanting to get into this industry and how easy is it it's hard man you're dead you're dedicating your life to making seeds and then you got to test those seeds and you got to grow those seeds and you're talking about six months down the line before you can even do anything with them well in those six months i've got zero gardens i'm cropping out either so i'm not growing anything for smoking it's literally just making seeds and there's it's so it's it's how it's it's very difficult at times to do everything and have it all you know, make sure you got everything that people want and, and, you know, taking care of everything you need to do. It's, it's, it's tough. It probably frees you up to a certain degree too, that you're not having to bring in product, uh, you know, heavy commercial production level of flowers too, right? Because, you know, growing flowers full time is, is, a uh, is an arduous thing. And, you know, you, you specialize on doing seeds, you know, like a ninja. And I, and I find that across our industry, people who are specializing, I mean, you know, we all need to know something about everything, right? Cause all of oh, these yeah. parts fit in together. Right. But, um, but I think that the people who are allowed to really study their particular discipline and they do it better than anybody, they reap the rewards because most everybody else is just kind of like a dilettante. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And one thing I'll say, not not to – I'm not trying to toot my own horn here or anything, but I have focused on trying to make strains that I knew were going to be great. I originally released, I believe, 12 – 12 strains or so were in my line from the time I told you I left Granddaddy on um, at that first Emerald Cup 2014. No, excuse me, 2015 was when I first had all my line fully released for everybody. Um, there there was – at one point I told people, I said, I'm not making any more seeds. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this line ride for a while till I see everybody has grown them. I don't want to be a guy that's got – you know, when someone comes up to me, what strain do you recommend? Well, I've got 50. You know, here, let me let me try and pick one out for you. No, let's – have you grown any of my stuff? Well, I've got 12 to choose from. Let's have you do this one then come back in two months and let's try another one. Like I really encourage people to let me help you find something from my line that I think you'd like and also just, just – tr- Give it a try. If you, if you trust in my brand and you like what you you tried before, then you will love all the other ones as well. So it's one of those things. I really want to be more of a more of an exclusive breeder to where I don't have 150 strains in the few years I've been out. I've I've got the my original line and I've just now broken off into making a few more and I've got more that are in testing now. But I've I'm not quick to jump to market with you know more than I can chew i want to be able to say that i've grown and i've seen things grown and can give you some solid feedback on everything yeah right on right on well eric i know that your time is valuable and so i want to thank you for coming on the show and you know i want to double thank you too because um not and just anybody would come on the show and talk about you know how to build a business because you know in a certain way you're you're giving out some of your special sauce secrets for how you built dungeons vault and you know that there's people out there that you're inspiring during this show who are now going to make seeds and are therefore you know seeing themselves as competitors but but you are so comfortable in you know who you are and your business that you were open to you know to talk shop with me other than just you know your own strain. So I appreciate you both taking your time and, and, and talking about how you did it so that the next generation can come up behind you. Hey, you know what? Thank you very much for having me. I, I really enjoyed myself. And, and to anybody out there looking to get in the industry and or do their own uh, seed breeding, I encourage it. Just know that, that it's, it's it, like I said, it's a cutthroat business, but that doesn't mean, you know, don't try. I say do what you love. And I, I love what I do and I wouldn't have it any other way. So if anyone tells you not to do it, just don't talk to them anymore because they're obviously not looking out for you. So do your thing and enjoy life and just do, let's all have fun here. So (laughs) awesome. If you want to find out more about dungeons vault genetics, you should definitely check out Eric's Instagram page at dungeons underscore vault underscore genetics.
You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I will be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los. Mm-hmm.